We had started last week talking about King Saul coming into power and the only people so far that really know anything about it are Samuel and Saul. And I was convinced last week that I had at least on one occasion, maybe on many occasions, called Saul Samuel and Samuel Saul as we were going through that passage and I went back and listened to the recording and I, evidently I didn't, but it, I was sure convinced that I had. So it, it may happen now that I've vindicated myself that I may do it all night tonight, but I'll try not to. Um, it starts out with Saul in search of his daddy's donkeys, you remember? And as he's traveling, they have no luck whatsoever finding the donkeys. But eventually his servant steers him toward the place where Samuel is. And upon meeting Samuel, he's told by the prophet that he's been expecting him, that he's got dinner set aside, they're having a sacrifice, and that he wants to have Saul join him at this banquet, which he does, spends the night with Samuel. And on the following morning, Samuel and Saul send the servant on ahead and Samuel anoints Saul king over Israel. So at that point, you've got a fellow who is the king of a very vast kingdom, uh, and nobody knows it but him. So that would be an interesting uh, circumstance to be in. And he goes back toward his house. Do you remember the three signs that Samuel gave him? He said, when you leave here, you'll find two men who will tell you that the donkeys have been located and that your dad is now concerned about your welfare, wants to make sure that you're okay. Following that, they would come upon three men who were on their way to make sacrifices and they would have some goats and some bread and that they would give some bread to Saul and his servant. And then finally, they would run into a group of prophets uh, along with whom he would receive a gift from the Spirit and would prophesy. So all of those things came to pass in the immediate future after Samuel had anointed him and told him to go on back toward the house. So I want us to go over now to chapter 10, verse 14. And we have a little bit of a segue into the next part. There are actually four parts in Saul's being inaugurated as the king over Israel. It doesn't happen immediately. It doesn't happen uh, necessarily in front of everybody all at once. It kind of sneaks its way in until Saul is finally the king over Israel. But 1 Samuel chapter 10, beginning in verse 14, Saul's uncle asked him and his servant, where have you been? Looking for the donkeys, he said. But when, they, but when we saw they were not to be found, we went to Samuel. So Saul's uncle said, tell me what Samuel said to you. And Saul replied, he assured us that the donkeys had been found, but he did not tell his uncle what Samuel had said about the kingship. So Samuel summoned the people of Israel to the Lord at Mizpah and said to them, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, I brought Israel up out of Egypt and I delivered you from the power of Egypt and all the kingdoms that oppressed you, but you have now rejected your God who saves you out of all of your disasters and calamities. And you have said, no, appoint a king over us. So now present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and by your clans. So this is almost exactly the same thing that happened back when they first came across the River Jordan. They attacked Jericho, wiped out Jericho. And the rule was that they were to keep nothing for themselves out of the spoils of Jericho. There were a few things that were going to be kept as holy things before the Lord. But everything else, I mean, absolutely demolish it, get rid of everything, don't keep anything. Achan kept some things for himself, things that were dedicated toward destruction before the Lord. Uh, because of that, Achan is called out, and eventually he and his family are destroyed. But the way that they find out who it is they call them by tribes, they call them by clans, they call them by families and by individuals, and eventually it narrows it down uh, 
to the person that they're looking for. Samuel uses the same kind of process to decide who the new king is. Now, again, there's two people already that know who the new king is. Samuel knows and Saul knows. Samuel is out in the big middle of everybody. Saul is not. He, Samuel calls them first by their tribes. The tribe of Benjamin is chosen. Then they choose by clan, and the clan of which Saul's family is part is chosen. And eventually they work their way down to Saul. The problem is that Saul is nowhere to be found. So Samuel inquires, and the Lord says he's hiding among the baggage. So all of these people from all over Israel have traveled a great distance, and there's just a place where they've left their stuff while they're all over here with Samuel getting introduced to the new king. And Saul, instead of being ready for his big introduction, is hiding among the baggage. So that tells you something interesting, I think, about King Saul, at least at the beginning of his kingdom. He is not someone who is seeking to be king. He's not someone who is very big and proud and bold in front of the other people. Uh, he's a humble guy. He reminds me a little bit of Moses when God calls Moses and Moses says, I'm the wrong choice for the job. I'm not the right guy. Or Gideon. God calls Gideon and Gideon says, you know, why would you choose me? I'm not the right guy. Saul seems to have the same kind of mindset. Uh, I wrote down a list of kinds of leaders. And you might think of some other types of leaders that I've omitted here. There are those that choose to lead but have problems getting anybody to follow them. I think we've all known people in our lives who thought that they were born leaders, but they were the only ones that thought that they were born leaders, and so they went around through their lives being disappointed because nobody followed them. Uh, there are those who choose not to lead, but who have followers. There are some folks that they've always got people behind them pushing and saying, you need to get out there and lead because you, we all trust you and we all think that you do a great job, but uh, they don't feel that way about themselves. Uh, there are those like Saul who end up reluctantly leading uh, and they have people who follow them and who think that they're the right choice for the job and then they have people who do not think that they're the right choice for the job. Uh, and then there in verses 25 through 27, you find that this is kind of the way that King Saul starts out. Uh, let's, well, let's start in verse uh, well, 24 and a half. The people shouted, long live the king. Right, so where do all these nations that have that as part of their uh, national anthems and as part of their, uh, their vernacular, God save the king, long live the king. Uh, Samuel explained to the people the rights and the duties of kingship. He wrote them down on a scroll and deposited it before the Lord then Samuel dismissed the people to go to their own homes. It's kind of anticlimactic, right? We've, we've gone from tribes to clans to families to King Saul. We went and found him, brought him out and said, here he is, this is your new king. And so Samuel writes things down. There's a list of rules that are to be kept before the Lord, which would mean that they would be placed near where the Ark of the Covenant was. And that was going to be the rules for kings. You don't really see this thing pop up very often. We don't refer back to it and say, oh, well, is he a good king according to the rules that Samuel laid down? But keep going. Verse 26, Saul also went to his home in Gibeah, accompanied by valiant men whose hearts had been touched by God. But there were some scoundrels who said, how can this fellow save us? And they despised him and they brought him no gifts. But Saul kept silent. In those days when someone was anointed king or made the, the chief over a group of people, then the folks would give him gifts to show that they were following him, that they trusted him, that they accepted his leadership over them. Most of the people evidently bought into that, and we're not given any kind of list of the types of things that Saul was given at his inauguration. He's not re-anointed, which is kind of what I expected, that Samuel had anointed him privately, and then we would have a public anointing. We don't see the public anointing show up. 
but the people are assured this is your king, this is the one that God has chosen. And because he's the one that God has chosen, they give him gifts, but some do not. Now, if you're the new king and you have power over all of Israel, how do you respond to that? Saul does not respond at all. He just goes home. Right? So again, very anticlimactic. We don't have uh, an immediate you know, big coronation celebration and, and that sort of thing. Everybody finds out what the king is supposed to be and not to be, and they all go back home. So stage three happens when Saul accepts leadership and ends up standing up to kind of the neighborhood bully. What do we know about Saul physically? He's a big guy, right? Uh, he, he's evidently good looking and he's head and shoulders above everybody else. Right? So he's a big guy. Uh, I think that serves him well in the beginning of his kingdom because people look to him as someone who can physically get the job done, a good leader for the armies, for the assembly. So let's go down to uh, chapter 11, verse 1. And we're going to read down through verse 8. And then we're going to talk a little bit about a different uh, text that uh, we won't spend a lot of time talking about it. But our English translations typically come from one of the translations of the Old Testament, which is the uh, Septuagint. It was, it's called that because there were 70 men, the Septa, uh, that worked on its translation from the Hebrew into the Greek. A lot of New Testament writers quote from the Septuagint. And then there's the Masoretic text. And the Masoretic text is more of the more Hebrew straight into English. But anyway, it, it's not necessary that we know much about it. But it's interesting just because there is a long-winded introduction to chapter 11 that doesn't show up in our translation. So we'll just we'll touch on it quickly. Uh, Nahash, the Ammonite, went up and besieged Jabeth-Gilead. All the men of Jabesh said to him, Make a treaty with us, and we will be subject to you. But Nahash the Ammonite replied, I will make a treaty with you only on the condition that I gouge out the right eye of every one of you and so bring disgrace on all of Israel. So who's going to line up for that deal? Uh, the elders of Jabesh said to him, Give us seven days so that we can send messengers throughout Israel, and if no one comes to rescue us, then we will surrender to you. So they know they can't beat the guy. But they, they say, give us a few days to see if we can muster an army to at least put up a fight. When the messengers came to Gibeah of Saul and reported these terms to the people, they wept. Just then Saul was returning from the fields behind his oxen and he asked, what is wrong with everyone? Why are we weeping? And they reported to him what the men of Jabesh had said. When Saul heard their words, the Spirit of God came powerfully upon him, and he burned with anger. He took a pair of oxen, cut them into pieces, and sent the pieces by messenger throughout all of Israel, proclaiming, this is what will be done to the oxen of anyone who does not follow Saul and Samuel. And the terror of the Lord fell on the people, and they came out together as one. So you have uh, a section of the nation, again, not a very large section, that's being bullied by Nahash. The difference in the Masoretic text is that there's an introduction that basically says that he's already been doing this, that he has conquered several groups around there and poked out their eyes uh, and subjected them to himself so that when he gets to Jabesh Gilead, they already know that this guy's serious. Right? So that's basically the difference, that one of the ancient texts has a little bit more prior to verse 1 than what we have in our translations. But this guy, Nahash, is the real deal. He's a bully. He can back it up. He has already done some conquering, perhaps, and they're scared of him. And they don't feel like they have any chance of standing up against him unless they can muster some of Israel to come and help them. Now, Jabesh Gilead doesn't have any clout. They can't get Israel to just come help them, but they now have a king. And so as the word is traveling, it comes to King Saul. What is King Saul doing when he gets the message? He's plowing. Right? So we don't have an established monarchy 
with a castle and a king. We have a guy who's been appointed king, wasn't really sure he wanted the job, uh, goes back home and just carries on with his life the way it had been before. The only thing that's different is that now everybody knows that Saul is the king. So when Saul gets the message and sends out word to the 12 tribes, he cuts up the oxen and he sends the pieces of the oxen out to the 12 tribes. What Does that remind you of anything? Do you remember when the man's concubine was killed by the Benjamites that they chopped her up and sent pieces of her to the 12 tribes and said, you guys need to respond a great atrocity has happened. It's interesting to me that now we have a Benjamite, Saul, who is king, and he chops up the animals and he sends them out and he says, if you don't come help us, we're going to come and chop up all of your animals. Right? So you've got a responsibility to come and serve in the armed forces. So he immediately puts out the call and they answer. Israel shows up. So instead of Jabesh Gilead having their eyes poked out, they suddenly have a, uh, an army that comes to their aid. Look at verse 8. When Saul mustered them at Bezek, the men of Israel numbered 300,000, and those of Judah, 30,000. So we have 330,000 men who have come together to fight this battle on behalf of Jabesh Gilead. That's the difference when you are a kingdom compared to when you are just a loosely allied group of tribes. And Saul is able to raise the army to fight against Nahash. That's his entry into really being a king. Prior to this, it's just Samuel saying some words and the people saying, long live the king, and everybody goes home. But when somebody comes against you as a nation and you've got a king, and the king can muster an army, and the army can save Jabesh Gilead, that changes everything. So uh, stage three is really the biggest stage in this transition because now they realize that they've got a king that can get the job done. Uh, they send messengers to Jabesh Gilead and say, we'll be there by tomorrow. Uh, don't worry about it. We've got this under control. Jabesh Gilead uh, tells Nahash, let's just wait till tomorrow, and then we'll surrender to you. And then when it's about time to surrender, all of a sudden, this huge number of men, uh, 330,000, show up to, uh, to help them against Jabesh Gilead. And I want to mention one other thing uh, before we get past this. Do you notice that they divide the, the army into two parts? Israel shows up with 300,000. Judah shows up with 30,000. At this point in the narrative, there's no such thing as Israel and Judah. Right? So whoever is writing this for us knows about Israel and Judah later on. Right? It's going to be another couple of hundred years before there is a northern tribe, the northern kingdom of Israel, and the southern tribe of Judah. We haven't gotten there yet. But when they're telling this in future generations, they're saying, well, of the ten tribes in the north, there were 300,000. And of the two tribes that eventually become the nation of Judah, there were 30,000. Right? So there's, there's a little bit of a difference. It, it kind of comes and goes. Uh, when David becomes the king uh, after Saul, there's some resistance from the north, and he's the king over two southern tribes, and eventually they reassimilate. Then after Solomon, David's son, they split up again, never to ever to be reunited. So anyway, there's just interesting that they list them out as being from the north, you get this many, <clears throat> and from the south, you get can, this can many. Can you imagine, and just, just think about it, how many men 300,000 men? Yeah. And, and the way that they fought wars in those days, this would have been two large groups of individuals lining up against each other and just running into each other. Uh, with with whatever weapons they had available well, to them, it was a heck of a collision. it was a, yeah it was absolutely a great collision and a and a lot of bloodshed that oh, when when we count uh, dead and injured in our days uh, even in in large scale warfare uh, you you get numbers like well there were fifty people killed uh, when some of these Old Testament passages you read uh, 
and the numbers are just outrageous, the, the number of the carnage. All right, look over at uh, chapter 11, verse 15. After they win this battle, he is now absolutely king over the people of Israel. Uh, uh, in verse uh, 12, the people then said to Samuel, who was it that asked, shall Saul reign over us? Turn these men over to us so that we may put them to death. Right. So you remember the guys who wouldn't give any tribute. They said, we don't want Saul as our king. So in the aftermath of this battle, when, when you win a big battle, you're all pumped up, right? The testosterone is flowing, and these guys are all excited. So now these guys who didn't want Saul as their king, let's wipe them out on Saul's behalf. But Saul said, verse 13, no one will be put to death today, for this day the Lord has rescued Israel. I like Saul on this day. There are days that I don't like Saul, but I like Saul on this day. He's not punitive. He's, he's not petty. He's more interested in what God is doing in his life and in the life of the people of Israel than he is of whether everybody likes him or is willing to pay tribute to him. So verse 14, Samuel said to the people, come, let's go to Gilgal and there renew the kingship. So all the people went to Gilgal and made Saul king in the presence of the Lord. There they sacrificed fellowship offerings before the Lord, and Saul and all of the Israelites held a great celebration. So we finally get the big inauguration party, right? And this time, all the ones who said, no, we don't want him as king, you don't get those guys, right? So Saul has won over the people. So we start out with a man who's just looking for donkeys and is surprised when Samuel anoints him as king. He goes back home. He doesn't even want to tell his family what's happened. He, he hides it from them. And then when we have the, the first inauguration, he hides among the baggage because he's so afraid. He, he doesn't want to present himself as being king. But then he gets the opportunity to lead. And when he gets the opportunity to lead and does so, he shows himself worthy of being God's choice to be king, at least at this part of his life. The problem for us is we know the rest of the story. We know that later on Saul makes some big mistakes. But early on, the spirit of the Lord comes on him. He acts on behalf of the Lord. He does a good job in this situation. And so we get to stage four when all of the people of Israel come together and celebrate that they really do have a new king in Israel. And his name is Saul. Now, any questions? Thoughts about that? A lot of people. Yeah, that's a whole bunch of people. Um, Just think of 300,000. That's three times. See you guys later.